welcome then Susan Stapleton, who has been the director of the Reading Birth and Women's Center in Pennsylvania for 25 years, with a particular interest in birth centers. And she's the primary investigator for the study which we're about to hear about. So Susan, over to you. OK, thank you. Well, welcome, everyone, and thank you for um, having me. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a, a study that was recently published in the Journal of Midwifery and Women's Health. Um, I was the primary author. Um, Tara Osborne was uh, also a co-investigator and would like to express her regrets for being unable to be here. She is ill this morning, this afternoon. So I'd like to talk a little bit about, for, this was a study of U.S. birth centers. I'd like to talk a little bit about the infrastructure for U.S. birth centers. Um, the American Association of Birth Centers has published um, the standards for birth centers, and these are actually the only national standards in the United States that are um, peculiar to birth centers. Um, the Commission for the Accreditation of Birth Centers um, is um, in place, and so there is a mechanism for birth centers to become accredited and to demonstrate their um, level, the level of quality in, in their care and in their operations. And 41 of the 50 states have licensure um, as either a birth center or um, some other um, some other sort of facility, such as an ambulatory care center um, or a maternity maternity center. There are various designations. Um, birth center staff have, uh, by standards and by practice, have um, equipment and training to manage common complications. And I'll talk a little bit later about um, some of the complications that were actually managed in the birth center without requiring um, have, requiring transfer to the hospital. Um, however, all birth centers have a system in the United States, have a system, or are by standards, have a system to provide access to acute care services and hospital care and obstetrician care um, if needed. And how that system looks can vary from one birth center to another. The design of, of our study, uh, it was um, the, the objective was to describe current outcomes for birth centers in the United States. The most there was a study published. The first national birth center study was published in 1989 um, in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, and that was sort of a, a landmark study of birth center care. Um, however, there have been no large studies um, since that time, so that's, um, we wanted to see if things had changed in birth center care um, during that time. It was a prospective cohort study of births in the 79 midwifery-led birth centers um, in 33 U.S. states um, from 2007 to 2010. We started out with 22,000, just over 22,000 women who were planning to get birth in the birth center when they registered for care. OK, Linda, I'm having trouble advancing the slides. OK, there we go, sorry. Um, our data collection was done um, with provider-collected data, and it was done using the American Association of Birth Centers Uniform Data Set, which is um, now called the Perinatal Data Registry. It is an online data registry um, that includes uh, both process and outcomes of care. It's based on the midwifery model of care. So it collects the usual um, obstetrical uh, variables, but also collects many um, variables that are not included in um, in obstetrical, um, in, the, in a common list of obstetrical variables. Um, so information about use of herbs and homeopathics, and information about ambulation and labor and non-pharmacologic uh, modes of pain relief and labor and that sort of thing. Um, it, the care is entered prospectively, meaning that it's entered immediately after the prenatal visit. The client is registered in the, in the registry. Um, and then the, de the data are collected continuously um, as she goes through her pregnancy um, all the way through to the final postpartum visit. There are about 189 um, variables. Um, and currently, the registry contains over um, 65,000 episodes of care. In general, the eligibility to give birth um, in a birth center are a single-term pregnancy, a vertex presentation, um, a full-term pregnancy, 
um, and um, and in general, no medical or obstetric risk factors that would preclude a normal vaginal birth or that would require intervention such as continuous electronic fetal monitoring or induction of labor. Um, both of those um, interventions are not allowed in birth centers and are not generally done, according to the standards, and are not generally done in birth centers. There are women, of course, who left the, left the care uh, who had planned to give birth in the birth center during the pregnancy. So there was attrition, so some of them lost pregnancies. Um, some of them um, moved out of the area, changed providers, changed their mind, and decided not to have an out-of-hospital birth, um, various reasons for that. Um, and then um, there was about 13% of women who left care during the pregnancy um, or, or met criteria, did not meet the criteria to be eligible for um, a birth center birth when they um, when they, um, at the onset of labor. Um, so things like um, twin gestation, preeclampsia, um, the most common actually was is post-date, um, pregnancy greater than 42 weeks, um, pre-labor pre rupture of membrane, membranes, preterm labor, those kinds of things. So those women um, were transferred out either out of birth center care but, or, and may have delivered with the midwives at the hospital but were not eligible to deliver at the birth center. About a third of the births in the study were funded by um, federal or state government programs, so Medicaid, Medicare, um, CHIP. And the demographics, this is a pretty um, homogeneous group. Um, about 75% were non-Hispanic white, 80% were married, and 52% were college educated. So this is, um, in general, a social, social, so economic, socioeconomically at least, a very uh, a pretty low risk group of women, as is intended for birth center care. The primary care providers in the birth centers, 80% 80, 80 um, of the um, of the, provide, the primary care providers were certified nurse midwives. 14% were either CPMs or licensed midwives. CPMs or midwives who were, were licensed in um, in their particular jurisdiction, um, and 6% were teams of certified nurse midwives and certified mid midwives, certified professional midwives working together. Um, credentialing for the facilities, 50% were, or 50, 63% were accredited by the Commission for the Accreditation of Centers. 37% were not accredited by anyone. Um, a couple of the um, CABC credit, accredited birth centers were also accredited by uh, Joint Commission. Uh, which primarily accredits hospitals in the United States. Um, all the birth centers in the study were licensed except for two in states where licensure was unavailable. General outcomes, 84% of the women who entered labor planning to give birth at the birth center did so. Um, and I think I left that off the slide, but there were um, 18,574 women who were eligible for um, for care at the birth center when labor started. 93% had a normal vaginal birth, 1% uh, had an assisted vaginal birth, and 6% had a cesarean birth. These numbers include, the, the last three numbers um, include the women who were transferred to the hospital, um, as well as the women who gave birth at the birth center. Transfers and labor, um, a little, about 4.5% were actually referred to the hospital in labor prior to admission to the birth center. We call these pre-admission IP transfers. Most of these were the, the kinds of things um, requiring this sort of transfer were um, breach presentations to, that had not been identified prior to the onset of labor. Uh, the most common one was uh, term rupture of labor, uh, rupture of membranes without, um, without onset of labor. Um, and then 12% of the women who were admitted, 12% uh, of women were, and were referred to the hospital in labor after they had been admitted to the birth center. Uh, and the most common reason um, is here for this kind of referral um, was um, failure to progress in labor or uh, abnormal or prolonged um, labor, primarily first stage of labor, um, more common than second stage of labor. And this was obviously um, much more common in prima gravidas than in women who had had babies before, in multiple first women. 94% of the transfers to the hospital were non-emergencies, again, mostly for prolonged labors. 
Um, so these women got in the car, drove to the hospital, um, and had pituitary augmentation of labor um, once they got there. Fewer than 1% um, of the transfers, actually 140, uh, required emergency transfer. The most common reason for emergency transfer in labor um, were, was um, non-reassuring fetal heart rate patterns that were heard um, on intermittent auscultation. Since birth centers do not do um, continuous electronic fetal monitoring, if the midwives hear um, variable decelerations or any kind of um, concerning heart rate pattern uh, when they're auscultating with a handheld Doppler, um, they transfer to the hospital for, um, for continuous electronic monitoring. Sorry, I'm having trouble with the slides. Um, transfers after birth. 2% of women were transferred after giving birth, and 0.4% of those were emergency transfers. Um, the most common reason for um, emergency transfer, uh, for transfers in general, um, and for emergency transfers postpartum uh, were retained placenta and postpartum hemorrhage. About 93% of the postpartum hemorrhages were managed at the birth center um, without the need for transfer to the hospital. 2.2% of infants were transferred after birth at the birth center. 0.6% um, of those were emergencies. Um, so um, the most common reason, but again, both for a non-emergency and emergency neonatal transfer um, were um, or was um, respiratory issues, ranging from you know, mild um, tachyp transient tachypnea um, all the way up to significant respiratory distress. There were no maternal deaths in the, in the sample. Um, fetal and newborn mortality rates were low and were comparable to low-risk births in the hospital. Um, that's a difficult comparison to make because it's um, sometimes hard to find um, cohorts that are comparable to the birth center sample. Um, and so we used midwifery um, hospital births from um, around the around the world, um, and um, and some low risk of obstetrician births as well. Um, the uh, less than less than one percent, zero point four seven percent per uh, was the stillbirth rate. Per, so that's zero point four seven per one thousand women. Um, and um, 0 0.40 newborn deaths or neonatal deaths per 1,000 women. So again, comparable to um, to those found in, in studies of um, similar low-risk um, births in the hospital. So about 84% of the women who planned to get birth in the birth center actually did so. Um, fewer than 1 in 16 had a cesarean birth. Um, and although this was not a cost study, we did um, look at uh, the potential cost savings um, of, of this um, of the sample. Um, and we estimated that um, there was a cost savings of possibly 30, greater than $30 million just in facility services um, for these um, 15,574 births. Um, that's something that needs, needs more study. Um, and um, but it's certainly an impressive figure in a, in a time when um, the United States and, uh, and other countries as well are um, really concerned about um, escalating health care costs. The most, the most significant um, take-home point for us, some of my slides are now upside down, the most significant um, take-home point uh, for us um, was that in over two decades of um, a time when there was increasing intervention in childbirth in the United States um, in every way, increasing use of cesarean infection, increasing use of, of electronic fetal monitoring, increasing use of epidurals, um, practically every intervention, uh, with no particular improvement in outcomes and in some cases um, uh, worse outcomes. Um, the birth center outcomes have remained remarkably consistent. Uh, birth centers in the United States seem to be doing the same thing that they were doing in 1989 when the first study was published. Um, 
and um, seem to be doing it um, with the same good outcomes that they were doing at that time. Uh -huh. So that is the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to address some of the questions that I see popping up over here. Yes, have you noticed the, the questions as they've gone by, or shall we recap a little bit? I have. I think the first question was regarding VBACs and whether or not VBACs were allowed um, within the birth centers. They are. Um, obviously, birth centers that are not accredited, um, and it would be dependent upon any state regulations that govern um, either birth centers or uh, midwifery practice in the jurisdiction. Um, but for accredited birth centers, um, the CABC, um, I can't remember the exact year, but um, ha actually uh, revised their position and does allow repeat feedbacks in um, accredited birth centers. And some birth, and birth centers may um, uh, request uh, approval from the CABC to do um, primary feedbacks as well. And, and there are specific criteria for those, for example, uh, being within some reasonable distance of um, a hospital that has 24-7 um, anesthesia and obstetrical coverage in-house, um, and having a collaborative physician who is willing to accept those, those transfers um, and that sort of thing. Um, so there was a time period, and actually in our study, we don't have very many VBACs because um, it was the data were primarily collected um, in a time, or at least the beginning of our study period, uh, VBACs were not allowed in the credit birth centers. Um, and most birth, the majority of birth centers actually did not attend VBACs. Um, however, since that time, um, more and more v, more and more birth centers in the United States have started attending um, have started attending VBACs in the birth center. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think there was another question, but if anybody has any questions, would they perhaps like to pop them in the chat box? because um, uh, we've got plenty of time for discussion. Um, there was another question from Diane who said that you said that certain things were not allowed. And her question was, would women, who would be, would women be supported if they did not fit the criteria but wanted to have their birth outside of hospitals, I'm guessing? Um, it depends a great deal on the birth center. Um, obviously, accredited birth centers have um, specific criteria that they are um, mandated to follow. And many um, of the states in which there are midwifery or birth center um, regulations also have mandated criteria. And that varies widely in the United States uh, from one state to another. Um, in general, um, it, I would say it depends. Um, some of the risk criteria are softer, I would, if you want to use the term, than, than others. So for example, uh, breaches and twins, in general, in accredited birth centers, um, well, not in general, in accredited birth centers, um, those procedures, are, those births are, are not allowed. Um, and the birth center, there are no accredited birth centers, at least that we're aware of, um, that are attending breaches and twins um, in the birth center. Um, and non-accredited birth centers, again, it depends completely on the state licensure. Um, in many of the birth centers in the United States, the, the midwives have um, also have hospital privileges. And so some of the things that are not allowed in the birth center, um, the midwives can continue providing care at the hospital, um, either independently or collaboratively with their, um, with their collaborative physicians. So for example, people who need induction of labor for post-states, um, or, or rupture of membranes at term without labor, um, preeclampsia, those kinds of things. Um, those can be done, uh, those births can be attended by the midwives um, if they have hospital privileges. Um, they simply can't they have to go to the hospital instead of being allowed to deliver at the birth center. So if a woman was wanting to, who, who did not fit the criteria, um, wanted to have her birth outside of a hospital, prefer preferably in a birth center, would she therefore, and, and, you and she was refused, would she then give birth at home? What would happen? Um, that varies. Um, again, a great deal, and there, aren't, there are no specific rules about that. 
Um, certainly some of those women do give birth at home um, with, um, with other midwives who have different risk criteria. Um, in some states, birth centers are regulated more, um, uh, more stringently than home birth, um, and so they, there may be criteria that would not allow um, a birth center birth that would not be included in the regulations for home birth. So that those, um, those vary a great deal from one state to another. Um, in the United States. Um, in general, um, the midwives, you know, try to um, communicate with the mother, talk about the risks and benefits of being in one place over the other, explain um, why they prefer not to do or do not do uh, a particular um, procedure or uh, type of birth in the birth center. Um, and um, hope to come to some compromise. But the bottom line is that um, certain things, if for accredited birth centers, are simply not allowed. Yeah, it is a difficult situation, um, one that birth center midwives struggle with um, all the time. So I see there's. And I may be going out of order, Linda, if I am, tell me, tell me. But I see there's a question, um, how do you feel about a birth center opened by an OB and supervised by that OB for the purpose of um, midwifery model of care, but that has all the modern OB conveniences, which implies that a C-section will be performed. Um, from my perspective and from the perspective of um, the American Association of Birth Centers, um, that's a maternity hospital and not a birth center. Um, Birth centers are designed for low-risk birth, which certainly would be hard to make the case that a C-section is a low-risk birth. Um, and indeed, so there are places calling themselves birth centers like that, um, but um, our position would be that those are not really birth centers. Those are something else, um, many hospitals, maternity care centers, um, but not birth centers. Um, what we know about birth centers, um, what we know about their safety um, and about their outcomes over all of these years is that those outcomes are achieved following um, specific criteria um, and caring only for um, for low risk women um, and avoiding interventions that make people into high, make, make women into high risk women so epidurals um, pitocin inductions and augmentations um, those things are are procedures that increase the risk of, um, of various and specific complications and, and so um, need to be in the hospital. Uh, and birth centers are not allowed to do any of those things. Now, I, I'm certainly aware, as the person who asked that question, there are birth centers who, um, and most of them are started by obstetricians um, or physicians, um, who don't really quite either understand or buy into the midwifery model of care or the birth center model. Um, and so they have various reasons for opening these facilities. Um, but in fact, we don't really know very much about the outcomes in those facilities. We don't know whether those things are safe. Um, and we do know that um, the model that I'm talking about and the model in this, um, in this study and in the 1989 study, uh, we know a lot about the safety um, using those criteria. And, you know, the other side of that coin, I guess, is um, hospital labor and delivery units, which are truly acute care facilities, um, calling themselves birth centers. A few states have um, birth center regulations that prohibit that, um, but they don't really enforce it very much, very um, stringently as a rule. Um, and so for consumers and childbearing families, it can be very difficult to know um, what you're talking about when you say birth center. Um, is it uh, this place like the ones, like the places that I'm talking about in the study and that I'm reporting on the study? Is it the obstetrician facility who um, sort of takes the, the medical model and moves it outside the hospital? Um, is it um, the acute care service um, inside labor and delivery with oak furniture? Um, it's, it can be very difficult for consumers um, to know uh, what that means. Um, so that they can make informed choices. <laughs>
I see another question that says, um, can women and birth and accredited birth centers um, go past 42 weeks? Um, that's not one of those sort of hard and fast risk criteria. We recommend that um, 42 weeks be used as a cutoff um, for birth center birth. And the primary reason for that, uh, for that risk criteria um, came from the 1989 study, which found um, quite a significant difference in, in adverse outcomes among the women who were past 42 weeks. Um, however, that was in 1989, and when those data were collected, um, the test, the fetal surveillance um, testing was not nearly as accurate and reliable or even as common as it is now. Um, so, so most birth centers that are accredited, well, most birth centers have um, some cutoff, and 42 weeks is a common one. Some use 41 because, um, as many of you probably know, pregnancies are getting shorter in the United States, and 41 has become the new post-state cutoff um, in, many, in many areas. Um, I would say the majority of birth centers still use 42. Um, but if you have a if you have a mother, for example, who has um, uncertain dating or who is 42 weeks and has um, very reassuring um, fetal testing, um, then birth centers will often um, consult with the collaborative physician, um, review the case, and make a decision to and, and of course with the mother um, and make a decision to um, to continue for surveillance and um, in the hopes that that um, spontaneous labor will begin. So that's one of those um, sort of soft risk criteria that we talked about with birth centers, but um, there's a fair amount of leeway. Again, unless um, specific state regulations for either midwifery or for birth centers um, dictate otherwise, which sometimes they do. Okay, Susan, I've been dripping in and out, um, had a bit of difficulty staying here, so... Um, I saw you were fine. I, I'm, I'm, I missed that last question. Have we answered the question that um, was asked by Geraldine about the uh, transfer rate being so low? Uh, no, I didn't see that one. Well, what she said was that the transfer rate was quite low, so did you allow people in the birth centre that were having their first baby and that was allied to my thought, because we have a lot of birth centers and similar things in the UK. And one of the mm -hmm. biggest reasons why um, those who are having their first babies transfer out is because of their, their, their desire to have an epidural, which, of course, the birth center doesn't um, give. So we have, a lot of, we have a lot more transfers for the reason of analgesia. Where do you stand in that? Um, there are no, um, most birth centers, I don't know of any birth centers who prohibit um, primary gravitas. Um, none of them do, do epidurals, well, except maybe that one obstetrician place that we were talking about before. Um, they use uh, a lot, we, what we find is that they use, uh, the average, when we looked at the data on the use of um, non-pharmacologic pain relief in labor, uh, the average um, woman in labor used um, five um, different um, different methods of pain relief. Um, the most common one and the one that people um, probably use the most and, and feel has the most effect is um, the immersion of water and uh, immersion in water in labor. Um, we, the sample included um, slightly more. And I, I don't have the study in front of me, so I may I may be wrong in this, but it, I think um, there were slightly more prima gravitas than. Um, than uh, multigravitas in the um, in the sample, if I remember correctly, there was not if if there was a difference, it wasn't much. Um, so these transfer rates include um, the prima gravitas, who obviously transfer more often. Um, the the desire for an epidural is actually not a very common, not one of the more common reasons for transfer and labor. It is um, it is a reason, but it isn't. It wasn't particularly common. Um, and it, that may be because the birth centers are um, doing a really good job of 
um, using other means of pain relief, or it more likely it's that those women who um, know or suspect that they are going to want an epidural in labor, um, you know, risk themselves out by choosing to have a hospital birth um, in the first place. And and certainly most birth centers in which the midwives have hospital privileges and in which they attend planned hospital births um, find that their overall number of hospital, the, the proportion of hospital births, planned hospital births to planned birth center births tends to um, sort of creep up um, over, over the years. Thank you. There's a few more questions and, in the oh. chat box. Would you like to choose one that you would like to answer yourself? Well, and I just saw the comment about nitrous, which reminded me of what else I was going to say in answer to the previous question. Um, there are, as far as I know, only two birth centers in the United States which are using nitrous oxide analgesia and labor. Um, it's um, it's uh, growing, and um, you know, as you, as those of you from um, many other countries know, nitrous um, can be really useful in labor and. Uh, unfortunately, the United States has been sort of behind the curve um, in, in terms of the use of nitrous. However, that's changing slowly. Um, and more and more birth centers are looking into the use of nitrous um, as, a, as a, just another option that they can offer to, to women in labor. Um, so our study included no, no women who, um, who, were, who were using nitrous, or no birth centers who were using, offering nitrous oxide um, in labor. So I see a question from um, Center about um, birth centers that care primarily for poor populations. This is a very, um, this sample is certainly not uh, a group of um, low socioeconomic women. Um, and therefore, you would expect, um, and, and as a result, the risk factors were uh, many of the psychosocial risk factors that you would see in that population did not occur in this population. There are really only um, a small number of birth centers in the United States that are caring for um, this um, poorer population in terms of the demographics, lower education, um, more racial um, vari uh, variation, um, you know, lower socioeconomic status in general. Um, their outcomes, um, interestingly enough, um, the individual outcomes in those birth centers um, have really not are really not any different from the outcomes that we find overall. Um, you know, the number of those clients in our sample is obviously really small. You can't see a whole lot about it, but um, if you look at the individual statistics of those birth centers, um, they're really very similar. Their transfer rates are very similar. Their um, their mortality rates, their um, rates of serious morbidity are very similar. Um, so it's interesting that birth centers can achieve this. And we're actually, um, the American Association of Birth Centers has actually just received um, a federal grant um, to, to, and we will be looking only at um, Medicaid recipients, women who are Medicaid recipients um, who have risk factors for preterm birth. So it will be interesting to see what uh, what we find um, in that. It's called the Strong Start Grant. It will be interesting to see what we find um, compared to um, the sample in this study that I presented today. There was also a question about the rate of water birth, what your water birth rate was. Do you know that, what it is? I don't know off the top of my head. I think we actually have um, a couple of my colleagues are actually in the process of, have just analyzed a lot of birth data from the sample and are in the process of writing, writing that up and submitting it. Um, so that will be out, but I don't know when. Um, it was, 
I don't remember the percent. It was uh, relatively low. Um, while most birth centers use um, immersion in water and labor um, for pain relief, um, the number of um, of women who actually give birth in the water is is less. Um, interestingly, the the finding when they did their data analysis on on the water births in the sample, they found that the the water births had a um, a lower incidence of adverse outcomes, which um, we did not take to mean that uh, water birth is safer than birth on land. Um, we took it to mean that the midwives are probably doing a pretty good job of getting people out of the water um, when there are um, risk factors that um, you know that would increase their risk for um, for adverse outcomes. Um, but I don't have any specific water birth data from this from this study. But but we don't have any you know based on the preliminary analysis. Uh, that my colleagues have done, um, it will be as good or maybe better than um, than the outcomes in this um, in this study. Looking to see if there are other questions that we that we haven't talked about. Um, I see a question from Catherine. Do, does the woman and the midwife um, sign a contract at the beginning of caroling out um, responsibilities of each? Um, all birth centers or the birth centers with which I'm familiar have. Um, Lots of consent forms, and mostly, um, more specifically, a general consent form that actually, and, and these birth centers are accredited birth centers are required to do this sort of informed consent. Um, so they go through what they, what kinds of things can be done um, in the birth center, what kinds of things cannot be done in the birth center, what kinds of things will re, will require transfer, what the responsibilities of uh, both the the birth center or the midwives and the client the client. Um, what those responsibilities are over the course of the pregnancy. Uh, so the, the informed consent process for birth centers, um, particularly accredited birth centers, is usually um, is required to be um, pretty um, pretty robust. And 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 part of that the reason for that is because um, we have found that um, no surprises is sort of a good approach. Um, so if you have someone in labor who needs a transfer, uh, you want to have had that conversation with her prior to the need for transfer. Um, and things go a lot more smoothly. I know that somebody is asking a question about um, group B strep. Right. Yeah, group B strep. Um, it, I see someone in Oregon says group B strep is a risk factor. It's not in general, but it's not in terms of CADC accreditation. And I would say in most birth centers, uh, um, again, with, with which I'm familiar, um, group B strep is not a factor that uh, prevents birth in the birth center. Most birth centers um, allow the mother, you know, have the mother give birth at the birth center, um, provide, um, talk to her about um, the CDC guidelines in terms of uh, group B strep um, screening uh, during pregnancy and uh, antibiotic prophylaxis in labor. Um, birth centers sometimes do um, have various approaches for providing follow-up care for these mothers and babies. Um, many of them, and of course, the, the, it's, which starts um, in, the, in the pregnancy when they're very much educated about uh, what to watch for, how to know if their baby is um, is okay or, or not, uh, signs of infection in, in, in babies and that sort of thing. Um, but also they, they are, it is not uncommon for the birth center to do um, earlier follow-up, so they might do a home visit at 24 hours instead of 48 hours for, for that family. Um, they might do more than one home visit, so one at 24, one at 48, um, just to check on, on the baby. Um, they might have the baby seen by the pediatrician or the pediatric care provider earlier than um, than they normally would. 
I know of a couple of birth centers where um, the mother gives birth in the birth center and then the mother and baby are transferred to the collaborative hospital for a 48-hour stay, which um, I think is unfortunate, but it does, it, it is um, in a couple of cases that I know of what they are required to do. Um, but in general, groupy stuff is not considered a, a factor that would prevent um, a mother from giving birth at a birth center. It's normal practice in the UK to give IV antibiotics, and that's one of the reasons why uh, women with group B strep um, have to give birth somewhere where intravenous drugs can be given. Uh, and so, in, in the birth centres in in the UK, there are not they don't don't do um, intrapartum prophylaxis. I would have to ask those who work in a birth centre. In fact, Geraldine Butcher is the one who's talking about this just at the moment, Geraldine. Oh, here. Okay. We can... Are you saying okay, Geraldine... Okay, so it looks... Go on. Okay. So it looks like... And, I, and in terms birth centers, um, in the United States, generally, again, unless prohibited by um, state regulations for midwifery or birth centers um, generally um, have IV, can do IV antibiotics and IV other, some other kinds of um, IV medications um, in the birth center. Okay. Have we any other questions from anybody? I'm sure, if there are any further up. Still got five minutes. If anyone has any questions, did we answer the question about the other five or the other four pain relieving measures used? Geraldine Butcher asked that earlier on. Oh, okay. Um, water was the most common one. Um, ambulation uh, and position change, I believe, was second. And then I'm not sure of the order of the others. Um, but um, continuous um, presence of um, a trained support person, um, massage, and massage and touch, and then I can't remember the fifth one. Um, but the, it may have been um, um, uh, music and um, auditory kinds of um, interventions. Music coming. So all the things that mothers, that, that families and mothers would do that, really. Uh, and the right. Would do that. Right. Yeah. Right. Obviously, the protocols about group B strep and antibiotics varies across the UK as well. There's a few different. Um, uh, yeah. there. Do you use pens in, in your birth centers? Um, there are some birth centers that use pens. That was not one of the more widely, it was fairly uncommon, um, but it, it was used occasionally by some birth centers. Same with um, acupuncture, um, herbal and homeopathic um, um, interventions for, for various things, for, for pain, um, also for um, for hemorrhage, for prolonged labor, those kinds of things. Okay. So where do you see, um, just to kind of conclude, where do you see your birth centers going? Um, are they going to increase in numbers, do you think? Um, do, you have, well, um, do you have obstetric units which have a birth center component to it at all? We have a few of those, um, and again, you have to sort of sort out the acute care labor and delivery units that are calling themselves birth centers from the um, in the hospital birth centers that are truly birth centers. But we have some very good models um, of birth centers um, using the model of, of care that I'm talking about here and the midwifery model of care um, that are located inside hospitals. We have another. Um, we have also have uh, birth centers that are owned and operated by hospitals 
uh, but are and are located on the hospital grounds, but are um, are outside of the hospital building. The, the, for, in order to be accredited by the CABC, the birth center can be inside the hospital, but it, can, it has to be separate from um, from the acute care services. It can't simply be a part of labor and delivery. There has to be um, many distinctions between the two, so that it truly is um, a birth center wherever it's located. And it's really not the location that matters. Um, it's the people who are there providing the care and their philosophy and practice style um, and the um, and the policies and um, practice model within the within the birth center wherever it's located. So you can have a very medical model place that the person from Florida was talking about before um, that's freestanding, or you can have an in-hospital birth center that is um, that is very much in the the birth center model as we're talking about here. Um, in answer to your question about where birth centers are going, I think um, we're seeing a huge growth in birth centers in the United States. More and more birth centers are opening. More and more birth centers are um, needing to open a second birth center because their first birth center is um, the is has outgrown its space and they need they need more space. Um, and so they're actually opening many many birth centers are opening second birth centers in the same community uh, or in nearby communities. Um, we're seeing um, a lot more attention to birth centers in general in the United States. Um, on the federal level, um, uh, by, in, by payers um, in, in many different ways. So it's an exciting time, I think, for birth centers in the United States. Um, just you know, getting this um, very large federal, five-year federal grant um, for, for looking at the birth center model of care was, um, I think, is, is certainly indicative of the uh, growing interest in birth centers in the United States. Um, so I was at a conference not too long ago, and someone who didn't like birth centers said, the next thing you know, we'll have a birth center. If that happens, we'll have a birth center on every block. Um, and those of us in the audience who like birth centers said, yes, that's exactly what we're aiming for here. And that's a fantastic way to close that session. Um, and it's yeah. very nice to hear that that's the way things are going in the States. So I have to say thank you very much, Susan, for your presentation and for the discussion that we've had thereafter. Thank you, and thanks to everyone. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to close this session now.